Please let's give a big round of applause to our 2022 International Obashan honoree, Rana Ayub. Rana. Thank you so much to National Press Club, to Jen, to Bill, uh, for this honor. Like Jen said, the moment, uh, the day they called me uh, to announce that I am the recipient of the Obishon honor this year, I was in hiding because uh, one of my colleagues, a journalist, uh, a friend of mine, who is a co-accused with me in a case, was behind bars for a tweet he wrote four years ago. Um, ironic, isn't it, that people who preside over genocides are feared by the world, but those who speak truth to power have been asked to stay low profile. That's the sign of the times we live in. To begin with, it's a huge honor for me, and I would like to thank the Washington Post for having my back at a time when journalists in India and top editors in India, um, where I worked, where I held, held top positions, pretended that I did not exist post-2014 when Mr. Modi became the Prime Minister of India. So thank you to the Washington Post for having my back through my toughest times. I would like to dedicate this award to a person who is not in our midst. Her name is Shireen Abu Akhle, a journalist who was killed. <laughs> Shireen didn't have to die. She didn't have to be murdered. She should have been right here with us. In her life and her death, Shireen exposed the hypocrisy and dual standards of the world on human rights. And that's the truth we all need to accept and understand, and more than ever before right now. And when I'm, every time I'm in the US, people talk about India. When I, when I tell them I'm from India, they say, oh, you're from the land of Ayurveda, meditation, yoga. Yes, true. Snake charmers, yes. I also belong to a country of 1.3 billion people, the world's largest democracy, with, a hundred, with 220 million Muslim population who are now at the cusp of a genocide, right? I meet officials here in State Department and top officials, high-ranking officials uh, in the US, and they say, Rana, what's happening? And I tell them, you know what's happening better than I do, right? And then I'm told, you know, we know what's happening in India, but you know, bilateral relationship vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, human rights be damned, right? Journalists be damned. And so ironic, two weeks ago, the US State Department was questioned about the impunity, um, immunity been given to uh, MBS when he was traveling, and they cited the example of Narendra Modi that he, when he was given similar immunity. So they did my job in a way by comparing MBS with Narendra Modi. That's exactly what I've been doing, right? Trying to tell the world that the man who you put on the cover of The Economist and Time is a man who has blood on his hands. He has. In 2002, a thousand Muslims were massacred in a span of two days when Mr. Modi was the chief minister of Gujarat. And we never even thought it as a joke that this man would become the prime minister. So much so the United States would not allow him entry into the US. And now you look at him. He has just taken over the presidency of G20. For this very speech, my country will tell me that I'm unpatriotic. I think, I believe that I love India more than I love any other country in the world. I love my country, which is why I'm here risking everything to speak because this could potentially be my last trip out of India. On the 13th, uh, in a week from now, I will know my fate. I know if a non-bailable warrant will be issued against me. I, know, I don't know if I'm going to be arrested on arrival. As soon as I got here, a charge sheet was filed against me, which means I cannot leave India after this. I'm going to use this opportunity to tell you the story of India in a gist. I mean, it's a big story. In a gist. So when I leave, I know that some of you will speak about the story that the world needs to hear urgently. It's a story not just about the persecution of Muslim minorities. It's the story of India, the world's largest democracy, sliding into a state of fascism. India's Home Minister, Amit Shah, was a man, unfortunately, and fortunately, I put behind bars in 2010 with my investigation when I published its called Records. I was about 25. And then I went undercover with eight cameras on my body, posing as a Hindu nationalist girl, um, for American Film Institute Conservatory, I went undercover and, and I met all the high-ranking officials in the Modi government, including Mr. Modi himself. And that investigation was killed. Um, 
after after almost after meeting almost every publisher and editor in India who said, Rana, this is path breaking. This is like the Watergate scandal. And I said, okay, you should, you should publish it, right? We could, but you know, things are tough. And I understand that, right? We don't have an independent press in India anymore. The world's largest democracy, the Prime Minister of India, has not taken a single press conference in the, in, in the last eight years. The Home Minister of India, the most powerful man, recently said that the 2002 genocide of Muslims, Mr. Modi taught the anti-nationals a lesson. Shouldn't the world be outraged? What will it take for the world to be outraged is what I keep wondering all the time when I come to the US, when I travel the world. What will it take for the world to understand that we are looking at the world's largest democracy, the land of Gandhi, right? But at this point of time, his assassin is being worshipped. Gandhi's assassin, people want to build a bust of him. We have a prime minister who routinely dog whistles against Muslims. You're all eating beef here, right? A beef steak. You could be killed for eating beef in India, especially if you're a Muslim. The number of Muslims who have been lynched in the last eight years of Mr. Modi's government for just allegedly consuming beef. And that's just one of the things that has been thrown at the Indian, India's Muslim minority. Why am I, I am I, why am I attacked so much? Because unfortunately, unfortunately, I also happen to be a Muslim and a woman. How dare I speak? How dare I speak in a country which does not consider me an equal? How dare I speak in a country where I'm supposed to be a second class citizen of the country? So I'm here in the United States receiving this award, trying to feel less alone at a time when I do feel very lonely. Uh, this year when the government filed money laundering charges against me, the Indian media just had me as the story when my entire life and my entire family was made a free for all. There were television cameras parked exactly right to my, opposite my house saying, we are getting first visuals of Rana Yub's house. I don't have a private life. When I go for over a walk, I feel when my neighbors look at me, I feel like, are they judging me? And I feel like all the time. Both my brothers have lost the job because of the call that I have taken to be a journalist. Both my brothers who are publishers uh, are no longer in, in, in office because they got to know that they're my siblings. Um, and that's, that's just giving you a gist of what's happening back with me in India right now when the government, the ministers of the Modi government have shared videos of my image morphed on a porn video, circulated all over the country in screenshots, my phone number, my address, doxed on social media, people sending me screenshots. The spokesperson of Mr. Modi's party put out a tweet saying, Rana's father soliciting prostitutes sitting in Germany when my father has never left the country was dementia. That's like a very tiny window into what I face daily. When I published Gujarat Files, which is a tell-all book of the undercover operation, my colleague Gauri Lankesh wanted to translate my book in regional language. She said, Rana, let's translate this. Let's get this book out. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. Um, and I was getting a lot of hate from the Indian government at that point of time. And she called me and she said, are you OK? I said, I'm fine. She said, babe, these are nincompoops. These are paper tigers. Don't bother. The next day, she was shot dead outside her house, right? You don't know these stories, and those killers are still out. This is just a nutshell. I can go on and on about India, but I feel that I'm sitting in a room full of editors, and I'm sure you will do, do your due, due diligence to get the stories of India out. I really believe, and I really have faith in you. Um, the last two months have been exhausting, and I'm actually on the verge of losing faith on what the world could do about India. But we are here journalists. We are here supposed to be. Um, a nuisance, like I believe, I'm a nuisance for a lot of people. Um, when I was coming here to give my speech, my mom said, try to have a one filter, try not to say everything that comes to your mouth. Um, 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 that's who I am, unfortunately, and that's why I felt like uh, I shouldn't be doing a lot of official meetings, but uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you for letting me pour my heart out. Thank you for making me feel less alone and isolated where, and at a time when I go back to a country where my friends who would earlier call me for coffee in coffee shops now call me home, they said, come home. I know why they do that. They don't want to be seen with me in public, right? I can't tell you how isolating that is, um, to be living like a criminal in my own country, a country that I a country who keeps asking me for a test of patriotism every single day, even if I could just pour my heart out. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you listening to me and my five minutes of whatever. <laughs> thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Thank you.